fear of public speaking. Um, so I'm pretty terrified right now, I do. And have suffered for a lot of my life from actually coming out and saying the things I want to say to people who I don't know. Put me in a comfort zone with my friends, I'm okay. Put me up here, all these eyes looking at me who I don't know. You know, it makes me feel a bit nervous, but I guess that's what we're about. Changes. Doing the things that are hard. Doing the things that actually take us out of our comfort zones. And I think what Dan was saying before, sorry, Paul, I called him Dan. What Paul was saying before, you know, some people almost don't have the balls to do it. I have a different take on that. I think you don't have the balls a lot of the time is because inside, nutrient-wise, they're lacking. And they have been for a while. They are, um, they're in a state where they're not themselves. In front of me, I see beautiful creatures uh, capable of self-regeneration, self-healing. I'm, uh, I'm a part-time geek. I spend a lot of time just researching subjects that, yeah, I'd love to have the letters after my name, the wages to go with it, and you know, get into the universities and actually experiment with some of my theories. But you know, unfortunately. That's not the, the academia was never my strong point, so I never went down that route. One thing I'm passionate about is genetics. One thing I'm coming across more and more is we've been taught your genes are your genes and you can't change them. That doesn't really seem to be the total truth, if I'm honest. It seems that we do inherit genetic mutations, but a lot of them a lot of the problems and ailments we have, what I'm now coming to call Western ailments, are actually caused by what we do to ourselves. I find every single day Mother Nature loves us, and every single day most of us throw it back in her face. Now, if we loved her back, we would reap them rewards, and those benefits within ourselves would would make the challenges that we find hard a lot much more easy to do. Now for me, I've gone through life, a little bit about myself, I guess, I've gone through life. In my early years, I was very ill, all the time. Literally had tonsillitis for about eight years, till the doctors finally took them out. With hindsight, I would probably wouldn't have had them out these days, because I want to realise what's going on then. It was the early stages of what you see in everybody. It was the first stage of me stopping to be able to reproduce good genetics. Therefore, I ended up in a state of disease as we now know it. From that moment on, really, I made it my goal to try and stay healthier. And as a result, Strangely enough, I just instinctively stopped taking antibiotics whenever I had something wrong with me. I stopped instinctively drinking tap water at quite a young age. The smell of chlorine just didn't sit right with me. And over the years, I've, you know, learned what I can. I've tried. Obviously, as you do, you end up falling into the trap of diets. We now know diets is it's very restrictive. I'm not, I'm not a fan of them, to be honest. A lot of people, I can talk to people about diets all day. It's my opinion, from my experience of what I've studied, that those that live the longest are the flexitarians, those who are prepared to take a bit of everything. More follow their instincts, more follow what the body's craving. I think if we go back to traditional ways, of farming the foods in the first place. If you 
look at what we've done to the soil over the last 50 years. I know we have a few farmers in the audience who would probably either agree or disagree with me. Feel free, you know, to interject if I've got it wrong, but it's my understanding that the soil quality now is not what it used to be because of the practice of using chemical fertilizers, um, using trace minerals, um, collated and uh, you basically synthesized in factories made into liquidized feeds that are put onto the crops that do not sustain a healthy crop. There was an old scientist, um, because I'm so nervous, that his name, I think it was called Albrecht. Um, he was a big proponent of traditional um, methods of maintaining soil fertility. He did many experiments that showed if you grow fruit and vegetables in the soil with everything they need, they don't get ill. The pests can't really affect them. There's no need for um, the herbicides and the pesticides that we use today, which in turn end up in our digestive tracts, which in turn can... And I don't want to go too much into the technical side of it today because I don't have my slides or anything set up and I think you know, I'll end up confusing myself and everybody else who tried to explain, you know, just how bad things can actually get with, uh, with herbicides and pesticides. But for me, I've certainly felt benefits over the years. I know I look very thin to, um, you know, those who don't know me, but if you saw how much actual physical work and exercise I do spend my time doing, um, you'd understand that, you know, I'm certainly getting something out of the foods I, I am eating. Um, and I found for me, it's more a lack of education, or is it a lack of interest on the behalf of the consumers who go out and buy these products? I have a few places where I can go and buy food. I'm very lucky, I live in Manchester. Um, I have a store called the Unicorn, that's it's one of the better places for um, getting some heirloom products, you know, products that come from um, a true seed, not a genetically modified seed or a seed that's been hybridized for yield, you know, for yield factors. Um, I prefer really that if we are, as a people, if we're going to sort out the mess that we're in right now, I feel that we're far too dependent on the very system that we are trying to change, as it were, or trying to negate or be, be less supportive of. I think if we came together as a community, we started to grow the food to, um, with each other, as, as, as Dan was alluding to before. We could also share our knowledge because I know, you know, my dad now, he's not getting any younger. He comes from a background where they knew how to prepare foods. I find these days, a lot of people, they don't know second, third generation, they don't even know how to prepare a, a meal from scratch. These are the very the fundamental, basic skills that we need before we can ever be useful for, for anyone. But to be a true custodian of planet Earth, you really do need, first of all, to realise that you are part of planet Earth, you live in a symbiosis with it. The way we're carrying on at the moment, we're reaping the benefits of going off on our own. We do truly behave. If you know how a cancer behaves, it, it, it starts to do its own thing. This is what we're, you know, quite often it's not through intent. We don't know any different. We work these long hard days, we come home, and the last thing we want to do is start scrubbing soil off vegetables, you know, start preparing meats, uh, slow cooking them. But I think, you know, it takes that just that little step to do the hard thing, to make that little change. And once you do, the benefits certainly, you know, outweigh the pitfalls. And for me, 
one thing I've found, because I've done it all, I've, I've eaten the junk food. I'll tell you a very brief story, when I was at school, um, in fact, I'll have to rewind. Again, we're going deep here now. Um, I was very, very young, I was sat in the shower. I looked down and I started to look to my legs and I thought, I'm fat, I feel fat, and this is I'm a young kid. And I started to get this complexity. Whether it was deliberate or not, I, I stopped eating as much as I would. But I started to drink a lot of Coke, a lot of Coca-Cola, loads of it. I started eating even less and drinking even more Coke. And at the same time, there was a lad who sat in my form, he sat on the next table to me. He was also drinking even more Coke than me. I started to get pains in my stomach and I hadn't seen this other lad for a couple of weeks when he came back to school. The break time, he had to drink this gook. I said, oh, what, what, what's that about? He says, oh, I've, I've, I've rotted the ass, uh, I've destroyed the lining on my stomach, so I have to drink this now before I eat anything. And I could feel that I was obviously, you know, in the early stages of what he was at. So I said, did it start with pains? And he says, yeah. And I think I, was, I wasn't very old then. But that was the first, you know, it was one of the first awakenings in me that, that what we put inside us does actually have an effect on us. What I see these days is people drinking fizzy drinks, the soft drinks. They don't realise what effect that does. That, it's phosphoric acid. Phosphorus sits in the brain. Phosphorus holds together DNA. If you're putting that in there, you're gonna <clears throat> you're gonna cause a lot of problems. For me, the only real things we should be putting inside ourselves are those that were created by the very system that we live by, which is nature. I think the more refined a product it is, the less benefit it has for us. People always ask me, can you help me to read food labels? Can you teach me how to read food labels? And it's ever so simple. If it's got a food label on it, you probably shouldn't be eating it. A pineapple, a potato, have you ever seen one with a food label on it? My grandma, my great grandma, they know they wouldn't have a clue. If I pass them a food label or a barcode or anything like that, they wouldn't know. I live with a man who was born just pre-war. There was no plastic or very little plastic. I said, what did you get all this stuff in? And he says, well, the cheese came in paper. The bread came in paper. The vegetables came in paper. Can you see a theme developing here? There was no plastic. And what do we use to make plastic? We use uh, well oil. Again, it's another industry cropping up another industry. Another bonus in plastic, if you look at it, that way is BPA. If you heat plastic up or cool it down, it releases, or certain types of plastic will release BPAs into the food, which obviously, you know, as a carcinogen, you don't want to put that inside you. But what I really, you know, I think what I want to say tonight more than anything is, from my experience, a lot of the problems that we're causing these days without, to do with our health, or to do with a lack of understanding of what we're eating, how we're eating it. And there's some very, very simple changes that are very, very, very old. And, and to, to be fair, a lot of people in this room will already know of them. A good example that I always tell people who say they've got arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. If you've got those conditions, then you need to start thinking about bone broth. Start cooking and rendering the bones, making slow cooking and making stews. What that will give you is a complex collagens, um, co complex uh, amino acids that will help you rebuild and replenish your joints. Quite a lot of the actual diagnoses we get these days, again, it's only my truth, as always, seek your own truth, but they're from lack of training. If doctors were trained more in nutrition, maybe if they were even sent 
a way to live with some of these people who do still live on traditional diets, who don't have degenerative diseases that we, we seem to propagate. We seem to almost expect these days. I mean, when I was a child, cancer, from what I remember, cancer was one in 16. That's what the advert used to say. I think it's one in two now, or one in three. So something's not right, because our knowledge should have advanced since 1980. Technology should have got better. Surely we should be getting on top of these. ADHD didn't even exist. We had 600 odd pupils in my school. I think there was, there was two of them were classed as, as we used to call it, the naughty children. From reading a lot of a lot of old studies that were done in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And again, when I, you know, when I put some slides together, I'll be able to, you know, give you the names of some of the doctors who carried these out. Um, there was one particular one, he took violent offenders, um, and he noticed a correlation between B vitamins and psych uh, psychotic behaviour. And he was able to rehabilitate over 70% of uh, anyone who was sent through to him. Um, I think we, as a species, have overlooked just how important the very building blocks that make us up are in determining how we behave. And I, I see these days, unfortunately, the spiral seems to be trending downwards. You, you know, we're not going in the right direction. I find, as I was explaining to people earlier, in my area, it would be easier for me Good quality food is expensive. If I could buy 25 kilograms of, say, potatoes, if I'm going to eat potatoes or what have you, I can't eat them before they'll go off. But if there's a few of you doing it, it's one way of bringing the price down and saving money. But it also, again, it goes back to that it brings us together. And if you're buying the food together, why don't you start cooking it, preparing it together? Why don't you start sharing a bit of your knowledge? When I eat this food, I find this affects me. Because that's what my life's been about. I could stand up here all day and tell you a little bits about this nutrient does this, this nutrient does that, this is how you can tell if you're missing this, this, that, the other. But I haven't really got time to go into that tonight. I just wanted to get up here, like I say, confront a few of my own demons, really. I guess I'm just being selfish tonight. Uh, I think. Another, another point I'll make, I've always been and spent quite a lot of time on my own. For me, it's just been easy to deal with a lot of the, you know, some of the, some of the pressures people and society puts on you, as it were. Sometimes it's easier to maybe hide or run away. With me often, I, I, I'm away doing my studying or, you know, I like my own time, but I think it's not something we can do on our own. I've got issues that, you know, I need a room full of people to help me confront. And tonight you've been that room full of people and, you know, I thank you for that. And if there's anything, you know, I, I'm no expert, I've got no letters after my name, but if there's anything I can ever help any one of you with, um, if you, you, you know, if you've always had a curiosity about your food, what you, you know, I'll certainly help give you my, my opinion on it. I'm controversial, I'm very honest, I tend to say what, you know, what I think. I don't like too much to get into the should I be vegetarian, should I be a meat eater. I endorse them all. Like I say, flexitarianism for me is is the only way that's going to see us through. I've read a lot of studies of people who've been around the world and they've been to the tribe. They've seen from frozen tundras where they eat nothing but meat really because that's all that's there and you know from places where you've got virtually nothing but veg they can maybe find a few insects there's a common similarity and the common similarity seems to be health they've never read a book about vegetarianism they've never read a book about you know why the Atkins diet's the best what they've done 
is just maintain traditional handed down values. And that's something we've been deprived of. I was very lucky. My mother, bless her, she did everything she could to make sure that I was happy. But unfortunately she doesn't understand the endocrine system as well as I do. Hormones, as you're a kid, are going to send you absolutely wild. So I went through my phase where her traditional home cooking was slapped off to her friends. And I only did that to make her feel bad because, you know, that, you know that's how our hormones work when we're young. I owe her a lot because one thing she always made sure was I had good, fresh, clean food. And when I went away to the junk food, it didn't last long. And I, what I found now, if I spend more than a day eating rubbish, I'm, I'm craving, I'm craving, you know, my clean, healthy stuff again. And I think, I find that food makes you feel good, makes you come back for more. And I, I for one, always hope that, you know, there'll be more and more of us discovering just how it feels. Because for me, when I start, well, I know when I'm eating well, because I, I land back in my head, I'm here again. There's days when I'm not there. Thousand yard stare, usually a calcium deficiency, or usually you're not metabolizing your calcium very well. Um, I think it's just nice to be home again at times, and I think a good traditional healthy diet helps you do that. I think we can really learn from those that have come before us. Don't be afraid of the fats, the real bad fats are the ones we're making. A stable, saturated animal fat, or a good quality coconut oil, they're good for you. Incidentally, coconut oil is pretty much your brain. That's pretty much the same thing your brain is made of. So I'm going to leave it there anyway, because, you know, like I said, I'm aware there's another speaker to come and he's, he's got a horrendously long set of slides. <laughs> I'm staring at my notes and it's, it's, so I'm not even going to start going into this today, but I would, if you want, if you want me to leave you with something, three foods that I really do value and I think are really good and we should be eating more of. I think, you know, again, we can grow most of the things we need in this climate. It's another, it's another fallacy that we, you know, we have to import all this food. We don't. A lot of it, a lot of it's already growing out there, to be honest, if you know how to. We just, you know, don't really know how to use everything. Um, but if you want something that'll keep you going, something that's going to be good for your blood, then beetroots, the red beetroot, it's always been a favourite of mine. And you, as I say, you know, you can, you, you can grow them yourself in the garden at home. You can eat the leaves. Um, another one that's very heavily involved in the termination of um, DNA codons is um, turmeric. Turmeric also contains boron. And boron is one of the, is the only element that can deal with uh, radioactive material in a, in a safe manner. It will, it will release it without disturbing any of, uh, any of its protons and, and nuclei, neutrons. Um, See, and I'm sorry, I, you know, this is, this is what I'm saying about in front of me. My nerves are getting a bit afraid at the moment. I've forgotten my last one. Chips. Chips, <laughs> that's it. It's good old chips. I knew, I knew you were good for something, Alex. Oh, the humble Brazil nut. I love a good Brazil nut. Selenium, it's one of those things. Selenium, the tumor suppressant. It's, Again, selenium is used where when DNA needs to tell something, DNA uses RNA to send a message out. Selenium is usually tied in with the um, amino acid uh, methionine, which is usually pretty much 99% of the time always the start codon. For the messenger for DNA. Now your body will always try and fill in the blanks where it can. When that happens the message gets scrambled 
And I think in 2014, the message has definitely been scrambled. And I think it's time we, you know, we clean up the airways, clear the channels again. Incidentally, another very brief but important point that I'd like to make to people. You're never alone. There's always someone out there who's actually probably been through something worse than you and gone through it. I'm not going to go into it tonight, but I've met someone once recently that that taught, taught me so you know so much about myself in such a short period of time, and I, I think it's just those little moments like that that if we get bogged down like Dan was saying, and we're too busy to do this, or I can't prepare my own food tonight, then we are going to miss those little life lessons. And that's all, folks. I thank you for listening. Uh,